The Canola School on realagriculture.com is brought to you by BSF Canada and Invigor Hybrid Canola. Hey, Kara Oosterhaus here with realagriculture.com. It is time now for another Canola School episode. I recently had the opportunity to catch up with Jack Payne, who's a Grow Team Advisor with FCL. Jack and I talk about some of the abiotic and biotic stressors you could be seeing on your canola seedlings in the next upcoming period, and what some of the management techniques are. Check out the conversation now. Well, I guess what we look at, Karen, I guess, first of all, when we talk about abiotic, we're talking about things that are environmental. <clears throat> so part of that, first one comes to mind is moisture. And, uh, you know, I, last year I saw in Alberta anyway, quite a range. You know, we had areas that were very dry in May. We had other areas in north and central Alberta that were flooded out. And what I saw was really um, where moisture, soil moisture and seeding depth come into play. So, for example, I mean that, that's always a good argument. If you want to get an argument between agronomists, what's the, be what's the best seeding depth for canola? <laughs> Is it half an inch? Is it three quarters of an inch? An inch? You'll get, you'll get varied opinions. Well, what I saw last year with, with canola in southern Alberta was it was very dry in May. It was extremely dry. And what I saw in some fields were uh, places where the grower had uneven seeding depth. And at a half an inch, some of that canola was stranded in dry soil, wasn't germinating. Other areas where, the, where he'd seeded a little deeper got down to an inch, some of that canola hit moisture and started to germinate. So what we saw was uneven emergence. We had rear, very thin stand, and when you got out and started digging around, what you found was the shallow canola was stranded, wasn't germinated, the other stuff that was a little bit deeper germinated and we had a thin stand of plants. Now what happened was the flea beetle pressure. Now we, now we start putting in a biotic stressor which is biological and because there were let's say only 50% emergence of your stand, those flea beetles came out and they just absolutely hammered those first few plants that came out of the ground. And so I always go back to seeding depth. Uh, a lot of people talk about seeding rate and that's very important, knowing your thousand seed weight and adjusting your, your seeding rate. But always check your seeding depth to make sure that you're trying to get as uniform emergence and, and planting depth as possible so that you've got more uniform emergence. On the other hand, what I saw in some other fields was the same situation with uneven uh, planting depth was that in, in a, a, let's say in an area that was very moist, what happened was the shallow seeded canola at half an inch was the first to emerge because it was shallow. The other uh, plants that were down an inch and a quarter, inch and a half hadn't emerged yet. So we had the same effect with flea beetles, only this time it was the shallow plants that came up first, had, a sh had very spotty emergence. Flea beetles ganged up on those plants and just absolutely hammered them. So too deep, too shallow, depending on the area that you're in, and again, depending upon soil moisture. So seeding depth is, is hugely critical for, for uniform emergence with canola. So when you're looking at that seedling survival and it's coming out out of the ground, how do you tell, is there any way to tell the difference between abiotic stressors and biotic stressors? Because IDing that is sometimes difficult too. Well, when it, when it comes to bio, abiotic, let's say for example, because there are some areas that were very dry, um, when you don't see any uh, emergence, uh, you don't even see the seed coat splitting, uh, you know that you've got a problem with a lack of germination, a lack of moisture for germination. Um, soil temperature is another factor that comes into play if you've had extremely cold uh, temperatures. Um, whether or not you get uh, fertilizer injury, now again, injury from fertilizers usually is amplified when you've got dry soil because I call it the healing power of moisture. Usually you can get away with a lot higher rates of seed placed fertilizer when you've got better soil moisture conditions. So oftentimes dry conditions lead to a perfect storm. You've got less water imbibed by the plant to germinate to begin with. Uh, you've got more uh, potential for toxic um, uh, problems from the fertilizer being seed placed. So dry conditions tend to lead to that perfect storm of emergence problems. Um, Moisture, again, you can have too much of it. 
uh, and you can end up with, with seedling diseases and, and, and that sort of thing. But typically dry conditions are going to probably give you more problems with emergence than if you're too wet. And now if you're looking at things like, you know, we're, we're, we're standing in, the, in a field full of wind right now, yeah. uh, wind shear, is there anything that can be done if, you're, if your little plants are coming up? And Well, I, I guess, Carrie, it goes back to the, the days when we talked about direct seeding. Um, you know, we, we have seen a bit of a shift towards more cultivation, more tillage in our, in our cropping systems. And when you kind of look, you know, behind me, there's very little cover at the soil surface. Uh, I remember back in the days when I worked with Alberta Agriculture, we were doing so much work with direct seeding, and we were actually taking wind measurements on a day like today, but you could actually see the microclimate effect when you had that standing stubble that those seedlings, the wind um, was, was much reduced at the ground level because the stubble was actually acting as a shelter belt. In terms of stressors, really, something we need to be watching for. I mean, you need to be watching for cutworms, you need to be watching for wireworm issues. Again, seed treatments are hugely important for managing those pests. But again, things like wireworms, cutworms, even flea beetles, they're really unpredictable. So that's why crop scouting comes in and is so important for monitoring because you don't know if you're going to have a problem or not. It, it, you know, you have to get boots on the ground to, to know whether or not you're going to have a problem with those insect outbreaks. And I think in every single one of these Canola School episodes, we talk about getting your feet on the ground, and I just do not think we can drive it home enough, the importance of scouting. No, I mean, it, scouting is hugely important. And I mean, we've got lots of tools. We've got uh, satellite imagery. We've got growth stage models. Uh, we've got lots of information that we can, and, and, and insect forecast models. But those are decision support tools. They help us make a decision. They, they give us some early warning of, of potential problems. But again, you need to verify it at the ground level. And again, good old fashioned boots on the ground. There's no substitute for them. Absolutely. Okay, thank you very much. Cool.